as far as Carson's talking about that move of camp forward, it's very true. You, you start camp forward once one person finds three people, three more people find three more people, and three times three is nine, and then the nine turns into 27, and then 27 people go out and get three people for two nights times three people, and that's all of a sudden up to 81, and then it just continues to grow and grow and grow and grow quickly. And that's what this whole idea is about today, guys, exponential functions. And what we want to ask is what are some of the characteristics of the graph of what's considered an exponential function? So goals to accomplish that for today. Uh, we're going to identify and evaluate exponential functions. We're going to look at what these graphs look like. Everything that we've been graphing lately, everything's been, what's the phrase or what's the term? All of our graphs have been what? Increasing or decreasing, but have they had any curve to them or have they always been straight? Right, so they've all been linear, right? Okay, so we're going to kind of go away from linear functions. And then we're going to look at how exponential functions apply to real life problems. So uh, in order to kind of look at this and understand what's going on here, we need first of all understand what an exponential function is. Guys, an exponential, here's the big word, it's going to be what type of a function again? Nonlinear. It's not going to be a line anymore. We're not looking at lines anymore. We're going to be looking at some curves and stuff. It's going to be a nonlinear function of the form y equals a times b to the x, where a does not equal what value? Zero. b does not equal one, and b is greater than zero. All right, I'm going to put a function up here, and I'm going to kind of uh, put some um, cheater terms in with each value to help you understand this. But um, an example might be something like this, y equals... Maybe, I don't know, 3 times 2 to the x power like this. Now, guys, you know you have an exponential function all the time if your exponent is now a variable. Anytime you have a variable for an exponent, that means you have an exponential function. Okay, a couple things I want to make sure you understand. This 3 right here, the 3 right here and the 2 right here. Okay, this value out in front. This value out in front is like how much you start with, okay? That three out in front is how much are you starting with. All right, so for this particular example, I might say that we're talking about bacteria growing. So at the very start of this, how many bacteria were present? Three, okay? Then, I'm going to go ahead and call this either a growth or decay factor. It's just going to be some kind of a factor. It's either going to grow by a factor of two or it might decrease by like by a factor of half. It might be cut in half. But this is going to be my, I, I'm just for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it my change factor. All right, what factor is everything changing for each increase in x? All right, so it looks like the three is going to start out at three, and then each time we're going to take three times what value? So 3 is going to double to what? 6. And then 6 would double to 12. We just keep doubling stuff, all right? So this is basically the same. Like how much are you changing each time? What's your change factor? In this case, we're doubling stuff each time. So if you can remember, that first value is the value that you start with. And this second value right here is by what factor are you multiplying or changing I think you'll be in great shape this section. Okay, so let's just jump into this uh, maybe science idea that we kind of uh, discussed here a little bit before we started this. It says in this front-loading question, the amount of bacteria in a dish conveniently doubles every what minute. Suppose that there were 15 bacteria in the dish to begin with. So let's complete the table for the number of bacteria after x minutes. Okay. Well, let's check it out, guys. How much to start with? If you ever start with something, that's always saying that's your time is zero or your x is zero. Okay, so to start with time zero, there are 15 bacteria. All right. Now, it says the bacteria does what every minute? It doubles. So after one minute, 15 would have turned into... 30. So how many are present after one minute? 30. All right. Uh, okay. How about after two minutes? 
30 is going to double to 60. Wowzers. How about the third minute? How many are there? 120. How about after the fourth minute? 240. Okay, now what you're going to be asked to do an awful lot today is this. You're going to be asked to say, well, I want to be able to write a function, an exponential function that represents how many bacteria would be present after any time x. Okay, now if you can go back up to the vocab part here today, if you can go up to the vocab part here and say, all right, the general form that I need to understand for exponential functions is y is equal to a b to the x. a really represents my, a is out front here, so a really represents how much we start with, and then the b represents by what factor are we changing after each increase in x. In this case, each change every minute or every minute that we have um, proceed in the problem. So what they ask you guys here is to write a function of this form right here to model how many bacteria would be present after x minutes. And this is what this starts to look like. Okay, Guys, within this problem, how many bacteria did we start with? 15. So I'm going to say the number of bacteria present for this right here. I'm not going to be able to squeeze it in that box. I'll put an arrow up here that says it's full going. We started with 15. And then by what factor was um, that colony of bacteria growing by every minute? Two. It doubled. So double means multiply it by two each time, right? So this is going to really be 15 that we started with times the change factor of two and then to the x power. All right. That would be the function that models what's going on here. And I want to show you something. I'm going to pull a calculator here quickly. Now don't forget order of operations. Would you multiply the 15 and the 2 first, or would you use 2 to the power first and then multiply? Okay, you've got to do your exponents first, right? So let me just show you something right here. It was very easy for us to think logically about doubling numbers from one number to the next. But let's pretend we didn't know that. Let's just say, hey, I need to know how many um, bacteria were present after four minutes. So all I would have had to do is plug four in for what? So I would have gone 2 to what power first? Is on two to what power first? So let me do that. Two to the, oh, there it is, fourth power. That's that. And then we're going to take two to the fourth power times how many here, guys? Okay, so for the fourth minute, so when I take this times 15, what did I end up with? 240. So does that function fit this model right here? It does. So, guys, knowing that model right there, let me ask this question. Can I ask you how many, how many, how many bacteria were present after an hour? Well, you said they double every minute, but within an hour, how many minutes are there? 60. So this bacteria started out being 15 bacteria. I don't know, maybe it was in the refrigerator. Something got in the refrigerator. And it doubles every minute. Okay, if there were 15 bacteria in my refrigerator, and I wanted to know how many were in there uh, under this growth rate of 2 after an hour, I would have to take 2 to what power first? Two to the 60th power, okay, and then times that by what? Well, times that by 15. That's how many bacteria would be in your refrigerator if they doubled every minute, if you started with 15 of them. 15 of those little things, I don't even know what that number is, guys. You want me to tell you what that is? No, I let me throw some commas in here. Thousands, millions, billions. Trillions. What's after trillion? A big number, isn't it? That's how many would be in your refrigerator after an hour if that was the case. All right. So to that, I say thank you, Clorox. All right. Thank you, Clorox. Kills 99.9% .9 of the germs. times this by 0 0.001. That's how many are left. <laughs> After you explain it on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, 
Maybe you did not think of Clorox. I don't know. All right. Regardless of that, regardless of that, do you guys kind of get what's going on here? Things are starting out low, but they are going to blow up fast. Or things might start out high and get cut down really fast, all right? We're going to talk about some things like uh, Zeno's paradox that, that is kind of interesting, that, but that falls in great with exponential decay, all right? Okay, questions on the first page at all? Yeah, Carson. I think you talked about that before. Is that where you put it in math? So Zeno's paradox is like uh, between the, the world's made up of a collection of points, and from this point on the wall to that point on the other wall or the opposite wall, there's you can keep going halfway, right? Yeah. So the idea for distance here is that, well, if this is a set point and that's a set point, how can you have an infinite number of points? Because there's an infinite number of halfways. If you keep going halfway, will you ever get to that wall? So how can you have an infinite number of points between two defined points? How do you determine distance like that? Make sense? So we'll kind of model that here. I, I think I, I think we got to talking about that in one class uh, one other day. It was, was it your fourth hour? Yeah. Yeah, you guys got me off task again that day. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean, that's an excellent example of what we'll talk about when we start looking at exponential decay. So all good stuff. This is good stuff. I get excited about this stuff. And if that makes me a nerd, then so be it. All right. I've already told you that I was president of the nerd herd in high school, right? That's what we called ourselves, president of the math club right here. Let me tell you. That's pretty fast at 400 on it, too. The math president was a school record holder for a while in the 400. My son came along a few years later and broke it pretty badly. So. Anyway, guys, identifying if functions are exponential or not. Okay. Just like we were looking for in the uh, um, previous example, doubling stuff the whole time. We want to be able to tell if something is um, exponential or not. So guys, what I do is this. Uh, we're always multiplying by a certain factor. So here's how I'm going to tell you to determine if, if, if something is exponential or not. Okay. The x values are irrelevant here. Okay. What we need to do is look from this factor to this factor and say, hey, is this exponential or not? All right, so what we do is we start working kind of backwards. Guys, what's 4 divided by 2 here? 2. Okay, so we're always going to be doing some division here now because division would be the opposite of the multiplication we want. So to go from 2 to 4 right here, we would really say, well, 4 divided by 2 is 2. So 2 double to what here? Four. Now, if this kept going on correctly, four would have to double to what? Eight, wouldn't it? Yeah. You said it was always back to the opposite. Sure, it's on our way. All right. All right. Lily, are you coming back today or? Okay. Um, if you want, this will be on YouTube for you. If you want to get the rest of the notes, and I'll email that assignment out to you. Okay. It'll be a uh, big ideas. All right. All right. Well, the next one would be eight, which it's not. So what I tell kids is this. I say, all right, check the 6 divided by 4. Uh, who's got a calculator handy for me? Who's got a calculator handy for me? Go 6 divided by 4 for me, quick. Oh, yeah. 1.5. So when I divide these two consecutive factors right here, I get 1.5. My question, guys, is this change factor right here that we're coming up with, are they the same value? Two the same as 1.5? Absolutely not. So what I'm going to say here is, does this table represent an exponential function? Here we will say no. And then the reason being is our change factor is not the same. That factor, 2 and 1.5, not the same. All right? So they ought to say no factor, factor is not the same. All right, so maybe I can tell if the second one, maybe I can tell if the second table is exponential or not. I'm going to look at the 3 and the 1 first. Kiddos, what's 3 divided by 1 right here? 3. How about 9 divided by the preceding one? 3. 9 divided by 3, what is that? 3. And then do the other one. Since the first two match, you've got to check that last one. 
So here we go. Check 27 divided by the preceding value of 9. That is also 3. What do you notice about the change factors here? They're all the same. So would this be an example of exponential function? Yeah, it is. This says yes, and why are we going to say yes? Because yes, because the change factor is the change factor is the same. And we can kind of think about this logically and say, well, I started with one, went up to three. So what do we have to multiply by? Three. Three times three would be nine times three more would be. See the pattern there? We're okay with what an exponential function is and what an exponential function is not? Cool? All right. So that's that's how you identify in a table if something's exponential or not. So right here, in example two, we want to start saying, well, let's evaluate something. Let's evaluate something. We've kind of looked at this already. Because I'm going to ask you some questions. In this exponential function right here, what's my starting value? Well, how much did you start with? Negative 3. What's the change factor? 4. Okay, so let's look at this. We want to evaluate this function for x equal what value? Simply substitute 2 in for x. So this is going to become the following. This is going to become y equals negative 3 times 4 to what power? All right, remind me, do I take the 3 times the, I'm sorry, the negative 3 times the 4 first, or do I take the 4 to the second power first? Okay, what is 4 to the second? So this is negative 3 times 16. So what's our value, kids? What's our value? Negative 48, good. Let's try the next one on your own. See what you can punch in there and get on a calculator, okay? You have two to start with. How about the factor for this one? What's your factor for this one? Okay, three is the value we're going to substitute in. Change factor is 0.25, isn't it? I'm going to punch this up here with you guys. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. Am I in trouble for this? So I intentionally asked you to kind of do this one on your own. Um, is there anybody that's having trouble getting an exponent to come up on their calculator? Do you guys have a button in your calculator that maybe looks like this? A little carrot key or an arrow up like that. Okay, you can use that. So you can go point, you can type in like 0.25 and then use that carrot key. And now what are you punching in for your exponent, guys? Negative 3. Alright, so I'm going to do that. I've got 0.25 to the negative 3 right here like that. That's just that value. I get 64 for that. And then what do I have to multiply that by, guys? Times 2. All right? How many got 128 there? Good? Okay. Now, if you run into trouble punching stuff in on a calculator, you let me know. All right? So I can figure out where your uh, exponential keys are. You let me know. Um, do any of you guys have a key that looks like this? The X to the Y key like that? Anybody have that key? So, McKenna, what you would have done is gone like 0.25 first, get that x to the y key, and then put in negative 3, and that would have gotten you that 64 part, and then finally times your start value of 2. So that's a button you could use there, right? Good. So what do we get as a solution here? What do we end up with? 128. Okay. So if I ask you to evaluate an exponential function, can you do it? Feel good about it? Any questions at all? Sure. All right. Any other questions on set trade? Trying to follow along pretty well. I know it's pretty new, but we're zooming pretty quickly through this. All right, let's roll. Page two.
So we want to start looking at graphs of exponential functions. And I think that we're going to defer to decimals for this. So why don't you guys make sure you're in decimals for me. Make sure you're in decimals for me. And uh, we're going to start looking at graphing exponential functions. And the big idea here is that my B value is more than what right here? More than one. I want to look at the characteristics of exponential functions when my B value or my, this is really our factor, B is our factor, by what factor are we changing? Okay. So we want to go ahead and graph Y equals 5 times 2 to the X. So uh, let's go in here and get you familiar with uh, punching that stuff in. What was the function again? Y equals what? Five times. And now this is what I wanted to get to. Anytime you start punching exponentials into decimals like this, always put your change factor or your growth or decay factor in parentheses for me, okay? So I will automatically put a parenthesis in here. So then I need the arrow to the right to get out of there. And then we want an exponent of x. And this is how you punch it in. Do you guys see this A to the B button right here? Okay, hit that so you can raise your uh, cursor up here. And then just hit X. And here's what we've got for a function. And I'm going <laughs> to zoom out a couple times on this. Uh, maybe once, maybe twice. Uh, yeah, I can do with that. So, we get a graph that looks like this. All right, we get a graph that looks like this. Is everybody getting a graph that looks like what I have up here? Am I cool with that? All right, so let's go back to the notes and find out what we're trying to establish here. Uh, I'm going to plug some values in here in a second, but I want to start with this value of zero right here. This value of zero right here. Guys, zero is always like the x value for our function to... start at. That's the x value that we always start at. Zero is like the initial, what we call an initial value. What are you starting with? So kids, here's the deal. Um, you're going to be asked to fill tables out that would reference points on your graph. And I want to make sure you understand this. So what I tell kids in exponential functions all the time is this. Find the x value zero because zero is the part that you're really starting your graph with. Okay. This was my original function right here, 5 times 2 to the x. What's the starting value in that function? 5, right? 5 is. 5 is that starting value. Thank you very much. Okay, so since 5 is that starting value right there, I'm going to say, okay, to proceed to the right right here, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take go, go ahead and take that 5 and change it by a factor of how much? Two. So to go from 0 to 1, 5 is going to multiply by 2 to turn into what? 10. All right. What's your 10 going to turn into? What's 20 going to turn into? Okay. 0 comma 5, 10 comma 20, or I'm 1 comma 10, 2 comma 20, 3 comma 40. I want to reference some things here for you. You guys have, well, you know what I can do with this one. Move this window over. Here we go. I'm looking at this right here. And here's my graph. And I'm going to start putting points in here. So the first point was 0 comma, was it 0 comma 5 on our table? point on the graph? 0 comma 5. After 0 comma 5, what did you have? What was the next point? Didn't we get 1 comma 1 comma 10? Is that on the graph? Check the next one. What was the next point? Gator, what was my next one? Is that on the graph? And then find the last one. What was the last one? 
three comma forty. Is that on the graph? See how all these points are on that graph? Now my question becomes, how do these points on the left get plotted right here? So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in for a little bit. How do these points on the left get plotted? Well, anything in our graph right up here. Here we were always doubling stuff as I moved to the right. How am I going to figure out these values moving back to the left where I have negative exponents? Thoughts on what this value might be right here? So let me maybe work this way. Let's pretend we're working with 40 would go down to what? 20. 20 would go down into... And 10 would drop down into a. So if I, instead of working from left to right, if I work right to left, what's happening here, guys? They're dropping, but what's the pattern? What's happening from one number to the previous number? They're getting cut in half, right? So what am I going to have to do to 5 to figure out this next value? Cut it in half. What is half of 5? 2.5. What's the next value? Cut it in half again. I'll just tell you it's 1.25. The next value, you take 1.25 and cut it in half, you're going to get 0.625. If I took half of that again, use 0 0.3125. 0 0.3125 is pretty close to zero. If I keep cutting numbers in half, am I ever going to get to zero? I'll get really close to it, but if I've got something to start with, if I keep cutting something in half, if you have something, you can cut it in half. Is one half ever going to be zero? Never will be. I'll never ever get to what value? I'll never get to zero. I will never get there. Okay? I will never ever get to zero. That's why I always tell kids to say, hey, you come work for me anytime I expect you to work. I will pay you by the second. That first second, I'm going to give you $10 per second. And then I'm going to give you half of that value from the previous second. So I'll give you $10 for the first second work. I'll give you $5 for the second second to work. But you're always making money, right? Every second you're making money. It's just half of what you made the previous second. How many are going to work for me? You're making money every single second. Even when you're sleeping, you're making money. I'll say you're not even at my place working. You're always working, but you have to show up anytime I want you to work. But you're always getting paid, no matter what. Every second of every day, you're getting paid. You're just getting paid half of what I make. You guys want to know how much money you would make if I said I'll give you ten dollars for that first second? You'll never get to twenty dollars ever. You'll never get to twenty dollars ever. Because it's that idea of like going ten and then ten more, but I keep cutting the value in half, so we go from ten to twenty. Go from ten to twenty. Halfway there. Five more, right? Halfway there. You will never get to twenty because you can keep going halfway each time. Keep going halfway. Never get to 20. Zeno's paradox. That's what that's called. Okay. So the question becomes in this right here, what's the domain and what's the range? Ah, darn. They came back. Domain and range. You guys remember the guy's name that we tried to remember that dealt with domain and range? First name Roy. Okay. The question is going to be coming. This is going to be very important for you with the decimal stuff to say. Um, graphically, what are the domain and what are the ranges? All right. Any exponential function, I'll just tell you this: for any exponential function, your x values can be anything. All right. Your x values are going to be all real numbers. I can put anything in for x, which is so I just say they're the real numbers or all numbers. I call them real. All right. So they can be all negatives, all positives, and zero. Now the range is what's really. Um, um, being answered here in this question. The range is saying what y values are covered in this. So if I go back to the graph and I look at this, I look at my graph here. Guys, do you see how if I keep zooming out this line as we get further and further to the left, it looks like it's right on this axis. It looks like it's right on the x axis. What y value is this? 
zero. Okay, now I, I know it looks like it, it hovers over here, but it's not. It just keeps going and going and going. But does it ever cross way down here at all? No. Okay, so for this particular example, I'm going to say the range is going to be, obviously it keeps going up, doesn't it? But it looks like it comes down and it gets really close to the horizontal axis and then it gets really close to it. You say it gets infinitely close to it. So your uh, range on this, this graph is basically all points above the x-axis. The range is all points above the x-axis. So I want to say all y values greater than what? Zero. All the y values that are covered here start here at zero. It doesn't hit zero, even though it looks like it does here. Um, maybe I can change that. Close. I can't quite change that, but um, maybe if I zoom into the Zooming in on values, you see how this is really getting starting to get closer and closer and closer and closer like that? I'll tell you right here, it's never going to get to the x axis. So, what we say for the range on something like this is that we have all y values greater than zero. Just all y values greater than zero. All right, so let's look at another one. Let's look at another one. Why don't you guys go ahead? I'm not going to worry about the table too much on this one. I want you guys to go ahead and type this in right here in the desktop. And let's see if we can't describe the uh, domain and range for this. So you guys jump in the desktop description and type that in. Say about the domain kiddos. You can type this in y equals negative in parentheses 0.25 to the x power. What do you say about the domain? How far left and right is it going to go? Well, okay, so what do you want to say about the domain? Like I said up here, the domain is a set of all. You guys fill in the blank. Anybody? All real numbers. Okay. All real. What do you guys find out about the range? This is a graph that's above the x-axis or below the x-axis. You guys got typed in there? It's below the x-axis. So it looks like it's all y values, not greater than zero this time, but all y values less than zero. Okay. All y values less than zero. Yeah, grab this here. Um, clean this up. We'll zoom home. And I'll type this in. We've got negative 0.25 the x power. There it is. There it is. It can continue to move to the left. It's going to continue to move to the right. So that covers all x values. But the y values that it covers up and down looks like everything below this x axis. So all y values less than zero would be the range on this. Okay. How do you guys feel about this? You okay with that? You guys been okay with that? All right. Well, again, I'm not going to get too wrapped up in values because you can plug those in. You can evaluate those in your calculator. You can plug in the x's and go from there. All right. Okay. Let's uh, let's see what's next. All right. Same thing right here. Same thing. Um, I want to talk about what's going on right here. We're going to start looking at graphing functions y equals a b to the all right, the x minus h and then a plus k. What I need to note here is the following. You want to do the same. h and k are some numbers. So you might want to write this down for this example. h and k are some numbers. Don't know what they are. They're just some numbers. All right? So I want to go ahead and look at what the effect of h and k would have on our domain and range right here. So... 
Uh, I'm not going to worry about these tables too much. I think that graphically that you'll be able to get this. So I'm not going to worry about this too much. If I asked you to evaluate it, I know you could. So I guess I really don't need those tables in there. All right. What do we ask the graph right here, kids? <laughs> yep, minus 3. So we've got this value of h. So did you guys agree this h value is negative 1 up here? And then this k value is minus 3. Everybody agree with that? Let's talk about what's going on here. Let's go ahead and graph this. Let's get into decimals and punch that in. So you guys will have to help me in terms of what I'm punching in. So, uh, all right. So it was, what was the function again? Y equals 3 times, and then in parentheses, 2, right? Yeah. To the... So I'm going to hit my A to the B and go X minus. All right, notice where it is with just an X right here. Notice where it is with just an X. I'm going to type in a minus 1. You tell me how this shifts. I'm going to leave my finger right here. I'm going to go minus 1. Okay, this point now is over, uh, well, looks like it's over here a little bit now, doesn't it? Oh, no, no, i got to keep x minus 1 as an exponent. Back me up. I think what I'm going to have to do is this, guys. Are you to the 3 to the 3 times 2 part right here? Do this for me. Anytime we have like an x minus 1, let's do this. Hit your a to the b button for a power, and then hit parentheses again. All right? And then put x minus 1 in that. Okay, here's where it is with just an x. If I go minus 1, looks like to me it moved over one unit. Okay, so this is going to move stuff left and right. And now what do we have on the very end, guys? Minus the 3. Okay, from where it is now, all right, it looks like to me I had uh, a point here, shifted it right one. That's okay, but watch what the minus 3 does to this. Drops it down, doesn't it? Looks like it dropped it down. How many units? And here's one, two. Originally, it was running right next to the x-axis here, but it looks like it dropped it down. Now, one, two. How many units did it drop it down? Not one half, but how many here? From the top to bottom, it was running parallel or close to the x-axis. Drop it down negative three. So, what's this effect of minus three half here? Takes your graph and either moves it up or down, translates it down. This thing, all right. All right. So once you've got your graph here, we've got to talk about what the domain and the range are. Okay. Domain again. How far left and right? Well, it's going to keep going left, isn't it? And is it going to keep going right the further this moves up? So what's your domain going to be again? What have they been in the previous two problems? All real numbers. Any value of x works here. All real numbers. The tricky part now is this. What's the range? The range is not running right next to the uh, x-axis anymore, but in fact, it's running next to this horizontal line that crosses the y-axis at what value? Negative 3. This value kind of on the end tells you what y value you want to be either greater than or less than for a range. So if I would punch in here, let me just do this. If I would punch in here a line y equals negative 3. See that line right there? This is like the new axis it wants to get really, really close to, but never gets there. So I'm going to say now the range is not y is greater than 0, but rather the range is all y values greater than, what is this value right here? Negative 3, isn't it? Okay. So the range for that is all y values greater than range is all y values greater than Negative three. So let's punch that in here. So what was my domain again on this? What was my domain again? It was all real numbers. What did you guys say for your range? I heard somebody John, did you say that? Carson did. What was it again, Carson?
that's supposed to be your training inspection or not? Yeah. It is. All right. It really is. Is that another page? Yeah. Let's see where we're at here. Um, you guys have anything down here? It's a big idea to use this. Let us see what I've got here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'm going to put these first two up here tomorrow morning. I am going to send the assignment out so you can get started on it. I think that I think that you guys have uh, seen enough. You would be able to probably answer these really well. Uh, we've talked about enough. But we'll finish up these last two examples tomorrow.